My name is Ralph Stewart. I'm a chemical hygiene officer at Cornell. Today I'm going to talk about the globally harmonized system for chemical labels and how it will impact laboratory workers. There are four basic goals for today's training. I'm going to talk about why chemical labeling is important for both people in the laboratories and for the people around them. I'm going to provide you an overview of the globally harmonized system, the words that are involved in it, give you some examples of what those words specifically mean, and then tell you what, how it's going to impact Cornell laboratories over the next year or two. Chemicals are the most common form of laboratory hazards. In fact, OSHA uses chemicals to define a laboratory. From OSHA's regulatory point of view, chemicals are materials that can change their shape and retain their properties. So if you're working with a, uh, some ethanol, as you work with that ethanol, it may become a, uh, maybe a liquid in a container and may evaporate and become a gas. It, as it changes its shape, it will retain its toxicity, its smell, its flammability. So chemicals are things that change their shape and retain their properties. The problem with chemicals is that because they are many different forms, it's hard to know what they are. This is an example of a situation that happened at the University of Vermont where the chemicals were not labeled correctly. Teas were dispatched to UVM's Torrey Hall after a worker was overcome by fumes. Firefighters say the worker was brought to Fletcher Allen where she was treated and released, but they quickly determined they had a hazmat situation on their hands. Part of our process is to evacuate the building, make sure uh, that no one else goes into the building, and uh, isolate the chemical if we can, and notify the hazardous materials response team. The Burlington Fire Department called in the state hazmat team and the hazmat chief briefed everyone on the plan. What I can tell you is when we go into these situations, the information is rarely accurate, and we have to play on the safe side because uh, we're talking about people's lives. When we do. And it's a good thing they did. They thought they were dealing with two containers of liquid, but that's not what they found. When we got in there, what we found is there were probably 40 or 50 bottles, and for us to analyze all of those would take an uh, inordinate amount of time. So we decided uh, with command that we would package them up and take them to a lab for analysis. The hazmat team was decontaminated as they came out of the building. They say the bottles were in garbage bags in the basement. The building houses some classrooms and a plant collection. The UN recognized that this problem was going to happen back in 1992. At the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, the issue of increasing global trade in chemical hazards or chem hazardous chemicals arose. The concern was that there were many different definitions uh, in different countries uh, for words like toxic, flammable, and corrosive. So as chemicals are made in China and shipped to Germany, are made in Mexico and shipped to the United States, the labels lost their meaning as they crossed boundaries. An example of this situation was a label on a chem Chinese chemical that was rendered in English as hurts skin hardly. The person who saw that label interpreted it to mean that it hardly hurts your skin, and used it without glove protection. Unfortunately, it, the, the intent of the Chinese person was that it hurt your skin hard, and it did create damage in the person's skin. So the UN recognized they needed better definitions that were globally applicable for specific words. They also recognized they needed to have a system for communicating those hazards, and so they came up with a system of labels and safety data sheets. This is an example of a safety data sheet or a label for propanol uh, and propyl alcohol. You can see that there are three basic components to this label. There's the name of the chemical itself. There is two pictograms associated with this particular chemical. One's for flammable chemicals and the other is for irritant chemicals. And then the third element is signal words. The signal words are either danger or warning, danger indicating the higher hazard associated with that chemical. There are nine classes of, of pictograms, nine pictograms that may appear on a GHS label. These are the nine different labels, and I'm going to talk about pictograms. I'm going to talk about three of them specifically. The others you can download from our website, information about the others you can download from our website um, if you want more details on that. Flammable liquids are an important chem laboratory chemical hazard that we want people to be aware of. The definition of flammable liquids in the GHS system are based on the flash point and the boiling point of that chemical. As the flash point decreases and it becomes more flammable, the category, uh, hazard category within the GHS system, the, the 
becomes exposed from warning to danger, category four being the least hazardous, category one being the most flammable. The reason we care about boiling point for flammable liquids is that they can create oblivious. If there's a fire around a container of a flammable liquid, the pressure, the gas pressure in that container will increase as the temperature increases. At some point, that uh, pressure increase can overwhelm the container and flammable vapors will start escaping. At that point, the container becomes like a flamethrower in that the flammable vapor will catch on fire and create a, uh, a flame that goes, carries away from the container. So boiling point is a key element in understanding why that, how hazardous a chemical, uh, flammable chemical is. It's also an important reason that we pay attention to how we store our flammable liquids in a laboratory. Flammable liquid storage cabinets are built to protect the contents of the cabinet from the a fire outside the cabinet. So in the case of a fire around this cabinet here, the contents of the cabinet will stay cool for up to two hours and avoid the, the likelihood of a bloody. Another situation that we sometimes find in laboratories is that people need cool flammable liquids to, to work with in doing their procedures. You use a, people commonly use a refrigerator to cool these temperatures. Unfortunately, sometimes they use a household refrigerator, which has a switch inside the body of the refrigerator. If there's a flammable liquid that is being stored in that refrigerator and there, the, tab, the container of the liquid starts to release the um, vapor into the refrigerator and the thermostat uh, switches on or off, creating a spark, you can have an explosion. And that's what happened in this situation in a laboratory. Uh, somebody left at the end of the day, uh, put uh, their flammable solvent in a refrigerator. Overnight, it exploded when the thermostat turned on or off. Fortunately, there was nobody in the room at the time, but you can see the amount of damage that occurred. Oxidizers are another form of hazardous chemical people need to be aware of in laboratories. There are many different uh, oxidizers used in our laboratories, including nitric acid and a variety of chromic, uh, dichromates and chromic acid. This video shows you what happens when nitric acid meets a organic uh, latex glove. Here, here is a latex glove on the beaker. And now I'm adding some drops of anhydrous nitric acid on the glove. The glove melts immediately, and now it even starts burning. Is the need cool? Nitric acid is probably the most common source of explosions in laboratories. Nitric acid is a strong oxidizer as well as being a strong. Uh, inorganic acid and there are situations that occur probably once a month around the country when a laboratory will have a release of nitric acid that results in a fire. The first event on this slide here occurred in Connecticut when somebody spilled nitric acid out of a cabinet and landed on a rug in a high school and the rug got on fire. The second situation is a, uh, a leak from a nitric acid in the back of the truck in Dallas. Uh, the, the nitric acid reached the wooden floor of the truck and caught on fire. And at the University of Kentucky, they had a leak of nitric acid that resulted in a response similar to the one we saw at the gym. This video will show you, provide a brief overview of what a urethane classification uh, tells you. <coughs>
So the challenge associated with irritants is that they are not a, a specific chemical can be an irritant in some concentrations and a uh, corrosive at other concentrations. A good example of this is phenol. At home, we may buy chloroseptic uh, at the drugstore, in order, which is about 0.5% phenol, in order to spray on our throats to uh, deal with a sore throat. Unfortunately, as it becomes more concentrated, phenol can go from being a non-hazardous chemical at 0.5% to being an irritant at about 2%. There's, that's an example of this sort of situation. It can be found in gross anatomy, anatomy laboratories where preservative solutions that uh, biological samples are kept in are often around 2% phenol. If you continue to work, uh, increase the concentration of phenol, for example, at home, some paint strippers we work with are about 20% phenol, or in the laboratory, we may work with uh, phenol core from solutions that are 50% phenol. At those concentrations, phenol becomes an, a corrosive a skin corrosive. So for phenol specifically, the DHS uh, definition is that between 1 and 3 percent is considered an irritant, more than 3 percent is considered a corrosive. This definition varies from chemical to chemical, so you, in addition to knowing the name of the chemical, you need to know the concentration in order to understand the hazard. NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, did a case study of phenol exposure and they found a situation where a lab tech who had been breathing phenol over the years had uh, also spilled it on his skin and had skin irritation. But over time, he began to have other symptoms, such as loss of appetite, darkened urine, and muscle pain in the legs and arms. He got to the point where he couldn't work anymore, so he stayed home for a couple of months. He came back and to work, on, and the day he got back to work, he had uh, the same symptoms occur within 45 minutes. At this point, he had become uh, sensitized to phenol because of the long-term exposure to it. And that sensitization went beyond skin irritation to include impacts on the central nervous system and his kidneys. This is a situation that we call specific target organ toxicity. So specific chemicals have what is commonly called STOT in the DHS system, where they can attack specific organs in the body. The challenge is that we don't find this information on the chemical label. It's only found on the safety data sheet which comes with that chemical. So before you work with any chemical for the first time, be sure to review the safety data sheet to see if there's something such as a specific target organ toxicity associated with that chemical. Safety data sheets are replacing material safety data sheets in the DHS system. So safety data sheets are good because they are not written by lawyers for lawyers as material safety data sheets for are written. Uh, safety data sheets are written by scientists, uh, industrial hygienists for uh, people using the chemicals. And they will point out other uh, unusual hazards of certain chemicals that won't be found on the labels. For example, the fact that peroxides form explosive are formed in ether and can explode uh, will only be found on the safety data sheet, not on the label. They also tell you what other signs and health signs and symptoms are associated with exposure to that chemical. It's important to remember, though, that any information in the GHS system applies only to that chemical or a chemical mixture that it's talking about. If you're working with a phenol chloroform solution, you need more information than the phenol SDS will tell you. You have to look at the chloroform SDS, and then even best is to look at a, a SDS written specifically for that mixture of phenol and chloroform. This is an example that we found on campus of a propanol container, which we use as a shipping container to move uh, five-gallon container, five containers of propanol from place to place. You see that in addition to the GHS explanation point and flammable symbol, there's also the red DOT flammable liquid uh, placard on this container. DOT, Department of Transportation, is not changing its uh, symbol system to conform with GHS because they have, are working with a different audience. The GHS system is designed for people who actually use chemicals, whereas DOT is concerned with people who are shipping chemicals over the road. These are two different situations that require two different systems. So, what do you need to do next to be compliant with the GHS system? 
OSHA's uh, requirements in 2013 is that employers train people to train their employees and people who are working with hazardous chemicals in their workplace about the GHS system so that these labels start appearing in your laboratories. Uh, you'll understand what they're trying to tell you. The good news is that Sigma Aldrich and most of the other major chemical manufacturers have already started using the GHS system, so you should be familiar with this already. In 2014, we and Cornell GHS are putting together a chemical inventory platform, which in addition to allowing you to inventory the chemical containers in your laboratory and track them to be sure that you know what you have in the laboratory and can easily report them to us for regulatory purposes, will also provide easy access to globally harmonized system information, such as safety data sheets or labels that you can print out to put on your chemical containers. We are planning on having this system available for general campus use in 2014. It's important to remember that it's not only stock chemicals that have hazards. Chemicals that you produce in your laboratory, either new chemicals or samples that are stored in other chemicals, need to be labeled similarly to the way that you, uh, the chemicals that you buy. We need to know the name of the chemical, the approximate concentration of that chemical in the container, hazards associated with that chemical, who we should ask for more information about it, and when the date that material is made. This is an important issue because it's, the community safety depends on knowing what the chemicals are associated with its work. The HAS system, which we use to label chemical uh, laboratories on campus as to the hazards, is not currently, uh, uh, does not currently incorporate the CHS system. You can see that we have old uh, chemical hazards uh, symbols in the system. Uh, we will be updating that as part of the inventory system that we're rolling out in 2014. Just want to remind you that every week in the United States, there are about three laboratory accidents. About half of those accidents happen in research laboratories. These accidents, all the, the numbers that I found are resulting from public responses to research and high school laboratories in the country. This means that emergency responders are entering laboratories in order to help people. In order to help people that, and be able to enter those laboratories, they need to know what the chemicals are around them. They will refuse to enter laboratories when they don't know what the chemicals are. So if you want help from people in case of emergency, it's important to maintain good chemical labeling in your laboratory. If you have any questions about uh, the GHS system uh, or you want help from us in, in helping to implement it in the laboratory, the best way to contact us is askehs at cornell.edu. Thank you for your time.